Section six of Elizabethan Demonology by Thomas Alfred Spaulding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eva Davis. Section six. The year fifteen eighty six was probably one of the most critical years that England has passed through since she was first a nation. Standing alone amongst the European states, with even the Netherlanders growing cold towards her on account of her ambiguous treatment of them, she had to fight out the battle of her independence against odds to all appearances irresistible. With Sixtus plotting her overthrow at Rome, Philip at Madrid, Mendoza and the English traders at Paris, and Mary of Scotland at Chartley, while a third of her people were malcontent, and James the Sixth was friend or enemy as it best suited his convenience, the outlook was anything but reassuring for the brave men who held the helm in those stormy times. But although England owed her deliverance chiefly to the forethought and hardihood of her sons, it cannot be doubted that the sheer imbecility of her foes contributed not a little to that result. To both these conditions she owed the fact that the great armada, the embodiment of the foreign hatred and hostility, threatening to break upon her shores like a huge wave, vanished like its spray. Medina Sidonia, with his querulous complaints and general ineffectuality, was hardly a match for Drake and his sturdy companions. Nor were the leaders of the Babington conspiracy, the representatives and would-be leaders of the corresponding internal convulsion, the infatuated worshippers of the fair devil of Scotland, the men to cope for a moment with the intellects of Walsingham and Burley the events which harsnet investigated and wrote upon with politico-theological animus formed an eddy in the main current of the babington conspiracy for some years before that plot had taken definite shape seminary priests had been swarming into england from the continent and were sedulously engaged in preaching rebellion in the rural districts sheltered and protected by the more powerful of the disaffected nobles and gentry modern apostles preparing the way before the future regenerator of england cardinal allen the would-be catholic archbishop of canterbury among these was one weston who in his enthusiastic admiration for the martyr traitor edmund campion had adopted the alias of edmunds this jesuit was gifted with the power of casting out devils and he exercised it in order to prove the divine origin of the holy catholic faith and by implication the duty of all persons religiously inclined to rebel against a sovereign who was ruthlessly treading it into the dust the performances which harsnet examined into took place chiefly in the house of lord vaux at hackney and of one peckham at denham in the end of the year fifteen eighty five and the beginning of fifteen eighty six the possessed persons were anthony tyrell another jesuit who rounded upon his friends in the time of their tribulation marwood antony babington's private servant who subsequently found it convenient to leave the country and was never examined upon the subject trayford and maney two young gentlemen and sarah and friswood williams and anne smith maid servants richard maney the most edifying subject of them all was seventeen only when the possession seized him he had only just returned to england from rheims and when passing through paris had come under the influence of charles paget and morgan so his antecedents appeared somewhat open to suspicion with the truth or falsehood of the statements and deductions made by harsnet we have little or no concern western did not pretend to deny that he had the power of exorcism or that he exercised it upon the persons in question but he did not admit the truth of any of the more ridiculous stories which harsnet so triumphantly brings forward to convict him of intentional deceit and his features if the portrait in father morris's book is an accurate representation of him convey an impression of feeble unpractical piety that one is loath to associate with a malicious impostor in addition to this one of the witnesses against him tyrell was a manifest knave and coward another maney as conspicuous a fool 
while the rest were servant maids all of them interested in exonerating themselves from the stigma of having been adherents of a lost cause at the expense of a ringleader who seemed to have made himself too conspicuous to escape punishment furthermore the evidence of these witnesses was not taken until fifteen ninety eight and sixteen o two twelve and sixteen years after the events to which it related took place and when taken was taken by harsnet a violent protestant and almost maniacal exorcist hunter as the miscellaneous collection of literature evoked by his exposure of parson darrell's dealings with will summers and others will show among the many devil's names mentioned by harsnet in his declaration and in the examinations of witnesses annexed to it the following have undoubtedly been repeated in king lear flibberty gibbet spelt in the play flibberty gibbet hoberty dance called hop dance and hobbit dance and frateretto who are called morris dancers habberdicut who appears in lear as abedicut smolken one of treyford's devils modu who possessed maney and maho who possessed sarah williams these two latter devils have in the play managed to exchange the final vowels of their names and appear as Modo and Mahu. A comparison of the passages in King Lear spoken by Edgar when feigning madness with those in Harsnet's book, which seem to have suggested them, will furnish as vivid a picture as it is possible to give of the state of contemporary belief upon the subject of possession. It is impossible not to notice that nearly all the allusions in the play refer to the performance of the youth Richard Maney. Even Edgar's hypothetical account of his moral failings in the past seems to have been an accurate reproduction of Maney's conduct in some particulars, as the quotation below will prove. And there appears to be so little necessity for these remarks of Edgar's that it seems almost possible that there may have been some point in these passages that has since been lost a careful search however has failed to disclose any reason why many should be held up to obloquy and the passages in question were evidently not the result of a direct reference to the declaration after his examination by harsnet in 1602 many seems to have sunk into the insignificant position which he was so calculated to adorn and nothing more is heard of him so the references to him must be accidental merely one curious little repetition in the play of a somewhat unimportant incident recorded by harsnet is to be found in the fourth scene of the third act where edgar says who gives anything to poor tom whom the foul fiend hath led through fire and through flame and through ford and whirlpool or bog and quagmire that hath laid knives under his pillow and halters in his pew set ratsbane by his porridge etc the events referred to took place at Denham. A halter and some knife blades were found in a corridor of the house. A great search was made in the house to know how the said halter and knife blades came thither, but it could not in any wise be found out, as it was pretended, till Master Maney in his next fit said, as it was reported, that the devil laid them in the gallery, that some of those that were possessed might either hang themselves with the halter or kill themselves with the blades but the bulk of the references relating to the possession of maney occur further on in the same scene fool this cold night will turn us all to fools and madmen edgar take heed of the foul fiend obey thy parents keep thy word justly swear not commit not with man's sworn spouse set not thy sweetheart on proud array tom's a cold lear what hast thou been edgar a serving man proud in heart and mind that curled my hair wore my gloves in my cap served the lust of my mistress's heart and did the act of darkness with her swore as many oaths as i spake words and broke them in the sweet face of heaven one that slept in the contriving of lust and waked to do it wine loved i deeply dice dearly and in women outparamoured the turk 
false of heart light of ear bloody of hand hog in sloth fox in stealth wolf in greediness dog in madness lion in prey let not the creaking of shoes nor the rustling of silks betray thy poor heart to woman keep thy foot out of brothels thy hand out of plackets thy pen from lenders books and defy the foul fiend this must be read in conjunction with what edgar says of himself subsequently five fiends have been in poor tom at once of lust as obdicate hobbididance prince of dumbness mahu of stealing modo of murder flibbertigibbet of mopping and mowing whose sense possesses chambermaids and waiting women the following are the chief parts of the account given by harsnet of the exorcism of maney by weston a most extraordinary transaction said to be taken from weston's own account of the matter he was supposed to be possessed by the devils who represented the seven deadly sins and by instigation of the first of the seven began to set his hands into his side curled his hair and used such gestures as master edmund's present affirmed that the spirit was pride herewith he began to curse and to ban saying what a pox do i hear i will stay no longer among a company of rascal priests but go to the court and brave it among my fellows the noblemen there assembled then master edmund's did proceed again with his exorcisms and suddenly the senses of maney were taken from him his belly began to swell and his eyes to stare and suddenly he cried out ten pounds in the hundred he called for a scrivener to make a bond swearing that he would not lend his money without a pawn there could be no other talk had with the spirit but money and usury so as all the company deemed this devil to be the author of covetousness ere long master edmunds beginneth again his exorcisms wherein he had not proceeded far but up cometh another spirit singing most filthy and bawdy songs every word almost that he spake was nothing but ribaldry they that were present with one voice affirmed that devil to be the author of luxury envy was described by disdainful looks and contemptuous speeches wrath by furious gestures and talk as though he would have fought gluttony by vomiting and sloth by gasping and snorting as though he had been asleep a sort of prayer meeting was then held for the relief of the distressed youth whereupon the spirit of pride departed in the form of a peacock the spirit of sloth in the likeness of an ass the spirit of envy in the similitude of a dog the spirit of gluttony in the form of a wolf there is in another part of king lear a further reference to the incidents attendant upon these exorcisms edgar says the foul fiend haunts poor tom in the voice of a nightingale this seems to refer to the following incident related by friswood williams there was also another strange thing happened at denham about a bird mistress peckham had a nightingale which she kept in a cage wherein master dibdale took great delight and would often be playing with it this nightingale was one night conveyed out of the cage and being next morning diligently sought for could not be heard of till master maney's devil in one of his fits as it was pretended said that the wicked spirit which was in this examinate sister had taken the bird out of the cage and killed it in despite of master dibdale the treatment to which in consequence of his belief in possession unfortunate persons like maney and summers who were probably only suffering from some harmless form of mental disease were subjected was hardly calculated to effect a cure the most ignorant quack was considered perfectly competent to deal with cases which in reality require the most delicate and judicious management combined with the profoundest physiological as well as psychological knowledge the ordinary method of dealing with these lunatics was as simple as it was irritating bonds and confinement in a darkened room were the specifics and the monotony of this treatment was relieved by occasional visits from the sage who had charge of the case to mumble a prayer or mutter an exorcism another popular but unpleasant cure was by flagellation 
so that romeo's not mad but bound more than a madman is shut up in prison kept without my food whipped and tormented if an exaggerated description of his own mental condition is in itself no inflated metaphor shakespeare in the comedy of errors and indirectly also in twelfth night has given us intentionally ridiculous illustrations of scenes which he had not improbably witnessed in the country at any rate and which bring vividly before us the absurdity of the methods of diagnosis and treatment usually adopted courtesan how say you now is not your husband mad adriana his incivility confirms no less good dr pinch you are a conjurer establish him in his true sense again and i will please you what you will demand luciana alas how fiery and how sharp he looks courtesan mark how he trembles in his ecstasy pinch give me your hand and let me feel your pulse antiphilus of ephesus there is my hand and let it feel your ear pinch i charge thee satan housed within this man to yield possession to my holy prayers and to thy state of darkness hie thee straight i conjure thee by all the saints in heaven antiphilus of ephesus peace doting wizard peace i am not mad pinch oh that thou wert not poor distressed soul after some further business pinch pronounces his opinion mistress both man and master are possessed i know it by their pale and deadly looks they must be bound and laid in some dark room but good dr pinch seems to have been mild even to feebleness in his conjuration many of his brethren in art had much more effective formulae it seems that devils were peculiarly sensitive to any opprobrious epithets that chanced to be bestowed upon them the skilful exorcist took advantage of this weakness and if he could only manage to keep up a flow of uncomplimentary remarks sufficiently long and offensive the unfortunate spirit became embarrassed restless agitated and finally took to flight here is a specimen of the nicknames which had so potent an effect if harzna is to be credited here therefore thou senseless false lewd spirit master of devils miserable creature tempter of men deceiver of bad angels captain of heretics father of lies fatuous bestial ninny drunkard infernal thief wicked serpent ravening wolf lean hunger-bitten impure sow silly beast truculent beast cruel beast bloody beast beast of all blasts the most bestial acarontal spirit smoky spirit tartarious spirit whether this objurgation terminates from loss of breath on the part of the conjurer or the precipitate departure of the spirit addressed it is impossible to say it is difficult to imagine any logical reason for its conclusion occasionally other and sometimes more elaborate methods of exorcism than those mentioned by romeo were adopted especially when the operation was conducted for the purpose of bringing into prominence some great religious truth the more evangelical of the operators adopted the plan of lying on the top of their patients after the manner of elias and paul but the catholic exorcists invented and carried to perfection the greatest refinement in the art the patient seated in a holy chair specially sanctified for the occasion was compelled to drink about a pint of a compound of sack and salad oil after which refreshment a pan of burning brimstone was held under his nose until his face was blackened by the smoke all this while the officiating priest kept up his invocation of the fiends in the manner illustrated above and under such circumstances it is extremely doubtful whether the most determined character would not be prepared to see somewhat unusual phenomena for the sake of a short respite another remarkable method of exorcism was a process termed firing out the fiend the holy flame of piety resident in the priest was so terrible to the evil spirit 
that the mere contact of the holy hand with that part of the body of the afflicted person in which he was resident was enough to make him shrink away into some more distant portion so by a judicious application of the hand the exorcist could drive the devil into some limb from which escape into the body was impossible and the evil spirit driven to the extremity was obliged to depart defeated and disgraced this influence could be exerted however without actual corporal contact as the following quaint extract from harsnet's book will show some puny rash devil doth stay till the holy priest become somewhat near as into the chamber where the demoniac doth abide purposing as it seems to try a pluck with the priest and then his heart suddenly failing him as demas when he saw his friend genius approach cries out that he is tormented with the presence of the priest and so is fired out of his hold the more violent or uncommon of the bodily diseases were as the quotation from cotta's book shows attributed to the same diabolic source in an era when the most profound ignorance prevailed with regard to the simplest laws of health when the commoner diseases were considered as god's punishment for sin and not attributable to natural causes when so eminent a divine as bishop hooper could declare that the air the water and the earth have no poison in themselves to hurt their lord and master man unless man first poisoned himself with sin and when in consequence of this ignorance and this false philosophy and the inevitable neglect attendant upon them those fearful plagues known as the black death could almost without notice sweep down upon a country and decimate its inhabitants it is not wonderful that these terrible scourges were attributed to the malevolence of the evil one but it is curious to notice that although possessing such terrible powers over the bodies and minds of mortals devils were not believed to be potent enough to destroy the lives of persons they persecuted unless they could persuade their victims to renounce god this theory probably sprang out of the limitation imposed by the almighty upon the power of satan during his temptation of job and the advice given to the sufferer by his wife curse god and die hence when evil spirits began their assaults upon a man one of their first endeavors was to induce him to do some act that would be equivalent to such a renunciation sometimes this was a bond assigning the victim's soul to the evil one in consideration of certain worldly advantages sometimes a formal denial of his baptism sometimes a deed that drives away the guardian angel from his side and leaves the devil's influence uncounteracted in the witch of edmonton the first act that mother sawyer demands her familiar to perform after she has struck her bargain is to kill her enemy banks and the fiend has reluctantly to declare that he cannot do so unless by good fortune he could happen to catch him cursing both harpax and mephistopheles suggest to their victims that they have the power to destroy their enemies but neither of them is able to exercise it faust can torment but not kill his would-be murderers and springius and hertius are powerless to take dorothea's life in the latter case it is distinctly the protection of the guardian angel that limits the diabolic power so it is not unnatural that Grishano should think the cursing of his better angel from his side the most desperate turn that poor old Brabancho could have done himself had he been living to hear of his daughter's cruel death. It is next to impossible for people in the present day to have any idea what a consolation this belief in a good attendant spirit, specially appointed to guard weak mortals through life, to ward off evils, and guide to eternal safety must have been in a time when according to the current belief any person however blameless however holy was liable at any moment to be possessed by a devil or harried and tortured by a witch end of section six
section seven of elizabethan demonology by thomas alfred spaulding this recording is in the public domain recording by eva davis this leads by a natural sequence to the consideration of another and more insidious form of attack upon mankind adopted by the evil spirits possession and obsession were methods of assault adopted against the will of the afflicted person and hardly to be avoided by him without the supernatural intervention of the church the practice of witchcraft and magic involved the absolute and voluntary barter of body and soul to the evil one for the purpose of obtaining a few short years of superhuman power to be employed for the gratification of the culprit's avarice ambition or desire for revenge in the strange history of that most inexplicable mental disease the witchcraft epidemic as it has been justly called by a high authority on such matters we moderns are by the nature of our education and prejudices completely incapacitated for sympathizing with either the persecutors or their victims we are at a loss to understand how clear-sighted and upright men like sir matthew hale could consent to become parties to a relentless persecution to the death of poor helpless beings whose chief crime in most cases was that they had suffered starvation both in body and in mind we cannot understand it because none of us believe in the existence of evil spirits none for although there are still a few persons who nominally hold to the ancient faith as they do to many other respectable but effete traditions yet they would be at a loss for a reason for the faith that is in them should they chance to be asked for one and not one of them would be prepared to make the smallest material sacrifice for the sake of it it is true that the existence of evil spirits recently received a tardy and somewhat hesitating recognition in our ecclesiastical courts which at first authoritatively declared that a denial of the existence of the personality of the devil constituted a man a notorious evil liver and depraver of the book of common prayer but this was promptly reversed by the judicial committee of the privy council under the auspices of two low church law lords and two archbishops with the very vague proviso that they do not mean to decide that these doctrines are otherwise than inconsistent with the formularies of the church of england yet the very contempt with which these portentous declarations of church law have been received shows how great has been the fall of the once almost omnipotent minister of evil the ancient satan does indeed exist in some few formularies but in such a washed-out and flimsy condition as to be the reverse of conspicuous all that remains of him and of his subordinate legions is the ineffectual ghost of a departed creed for the resuscitation of which no man will move a finger it is perfectly impossible for us therefore to comprehend although by an effort we may perhaps bring ourselves to imagine the horror and loathing with which good men entirely believing in the existence and omnipresence of countless legions of evil spirits able and anxious to perpetrate the mischiefs that it has been the object of these pages in some part to describe would regard those who for their own selfish gratification deliberately surrendered their hopes of eternal happiness in exchange for an alliance with the devils which would render these ten times more capable than before of working their wicked wills to men believing this no punishment could seem too sudden or too terrible for such offenders against religion and society and no means of possible detection too slight or far-fetched to be neglected indeed it might reasonably appear to them better that many innocent persons should perish with the assurance of future reward for their undeserved sufferings than that a single guilty one should escape undetected and become the medium by which the devil might destroy more souls but the persecuted far more than the persecutors deserve our sympathy although they rarely obtain it it is frequently asserted that the absolute truth of a doctrine is the only support that will enable its adherents successfully 
to weather the storms of persecution those who assent to this proposition must be prepared to find a large amount of truth in the beliefs known to us under the name of witchcraft if the position is to be successfully maintained for never was any sect persecuted more systematically or with more relentlessness than these little offending heretics protestants and catholics anglicans and calvinists so ready at all times to commit one another to the flames and to the headsmen found in this matter common ground upon which all could heartily unite for the grand purpose of extirpating error when out of the quiet of our own times we look back upon the terrors of the tower and the smoke and glare of smithfield we think with mingled pity and admiration of those brave men and women who in the sixteenth century enriched with their blood and ashes the soil from whence was to spring our political and religious freedom but no wit of admiration hardly a glimmer of pity is even casually evinced for those poor creatures who neglected despised and abhorred were at the same time dying the same agonizing death and passing through the torment of the flames to that something after death the undiscovered country without the sweet assurance which sustained their better remembered fellow sufferers that beyond the martyr's cross was waiting the martyr's crown no such hope supported those who were condemned to die for the crime of witchcraft their anticipations of the future were as dreary as their memories of the past and no friendly voice was raised or hand stretched out to encourage or console them during that last sad journey their hope of mercy from man was small strangulation before the application of the fire instead of the more lingering and painful death at most their hope of mercy from heaven nothing yet under these circumstances the most auspicious perhaps that could be imagined for the extirpation of a heretical belief persecution failed to effect its object the more the government burnt the witches the more the crime of witchcraft spread and it was not until an attitude of contemptuous toleration was adopted towards the culprits that the belief died down gradually but surely not on account of the conclusiveness of the arguments directed against it but from its own inherent lack of vitality the history and phenomena of witchcraft have been so admirably treated by more than one modern investigator as to render it unnecessary to deal exhaustively with a subject which presents such a vast amount of material for arrangement and comment the scope of the following remarks will therefore be limited to a consideration of such features of the subject as appear to throw light upon the supernaturalism in macbeth this consideration will be carried out with some minuteness as certain modern critics importing mythological learning that is the outcome of comparatively recent investigation into the interpretation of the text have declared that the three sisters who play such an important part in that drama are not witches at all but are or are intimately allied to the norns or fates of scandinavian paganism it will be the object of the following pages to illustrate the contemporary belief concerning witches and their powers by showing that nearly every characteristic point attributed to the sisters has its counterpart in contemporary witch lore that some of the allusions indeed bear so strong a resemblance to certain events that had transpired not many years before macbeth was written that it is not improbable that shakespeare was alluding to them in much the same off-hand cursory manner as he did to the many incident when writing king lear the first critic whose comments upon this subject call for notice is the eminent gervinus in evident ignorance of the history of witchcraft he says in the witches shakespeare has made use of the popular belief in evil geniuses and in adverse persecutors of mankind and has produced a similar but darker race of beings just as he made use of the belief in fairies in the midsummer night's dream this creation is less attractive and complete but not less masterly 
the poet in the text of the play itself calls these beings witches only derogatorily they call themselves weird sisters the fates bore this denomination and the sisters remind us indeed of the northern fates or valkyries they appear wild and weather-beaten in exterior and attire common in speech ignoble half-human creatures ugly as the evil one and in like manner old and of neither sex they are guided by more powerful masters their work entirely springs from delight in evil and they are wholly devoid of human sympathies they are simply the embodiment of inward temptation they come in storm and vanish in air like corporeal impulses which originating in the blood cast up bubbles of sin and ambition in the soul they are weird sisters only in the sense in which men carry their own fates within their bosoms this criticism is so entirely subjective and unsupported by evidence that it is difficult to deal satisfactorily with it it will be shown hereafter that this description does not apply in the least to the scandinavian norns while so far as it is true to shakespeare's text it does not clash with contemporary records of the appearance and actions of witches the next writer to bring forward a view of this character was the rev f g flay the well-known shakespeare critic whose ingenious efforts in iconoclasm cause a curious alternation of feeling between admiration and amazement his argument is unfortunately mixed up with a question of textual criticism for he rejects certain scenes in the play as the work of the inferior dramatist middleton the question relating to the text will only be noticed so far as it is inextricably involved with the argument respecting the nature of the weird sisters mr flay's position is shortly this he thinks that shakespeare's play commenced with the entrance of macbeth and banquo in the third scene of the first act and that the weird sisters who subsequently take part in that scene are norns not witches and that in the first scene of the fourth act shakespeare discarded the norns and introduced three entirely new characters who were intended to be genuine witches the evidence which can be produced in support of this theory apart from question of style and probability is threefold the first proof is derived from a manuscript entitled the book of plays and notes thereof for common policy written by a somewhat famous magician doctor simon foreman who was implicated in the murder of sir thomas overbury he says in macbeth at the globe sixteen ten the twentieth april saturday there was to be observed first how macbeth and banquo two noblemen of scotland riding through a wood there stood before them three women fairies or nymphs and saluted macbeth saying three times unto him hail macbeth king of cador for thou shalt be a king but thou shalt beget no kings etc this if foreman's account held together decently in other respects would be strong although not conclusive evidence in favor of the theory but the whole note is so full of inconsistencies and misstatements that it is not unfair to conclude either that the writer was not paying marvellous attention to the entertainment he professed to describe or that the player's copy differed in many essential points from the present text not the least conspicuous of these inconsistencies is the account of the sister's greeting of macbeth just quoted subsequently foreman narrates that duncan created macbeth prince of cumberland and that when macbeth had murdered the king the blood on his hands could not be washed off by any means nor from his wife's hands which handled the bloody daggers in hiding them by which means they became both much amazed and affronted such a loose narration cannot be relied upon if the text in question contains any evidence at all rebutting the conclusion that the sisters are intended to be women fairies or nymphs the second piece of the evidence is the story of macbeth as it is narrated by holland's head from which shakespeare derived his material in that account we read that it fortuned as macbeth and banquo journeyed toward Ferres, where the king then lay 
they went sporting by the way together without other company save only themselves passing through the woods and fields when suddenly in the midst of a land there met them three women in strange and wild apparel resembling creatures of elder world whom when they attentively beheld wondering much at the sight the first of them spake and said all hail macbeth thane of glams for he had lately entered into that dignity and office by the death of his father sunil the second of them said hail macbeth thane of cawdor but the third said all hail macbeth that hereafter shall be king of scotland afterwards the common opinion was that these women were either the weird sisters that is as ye would say the goddesses of destiny or else some nymphs or fairies endued with knowledge of prophecy by their necromantical science because everything came to pass as they had spoken this is all that is heard of these goddesses of destiny in hollinshead's narrative macbeth is warned to beware macduff by certain wizards in whose words he put great confidence and the false promises were made to him by a certain witch whom he had in great trust who had told him that he should never be slain with man born of any woman nor vanquished till the wood of burnane came to the castle of dunsinane in this account we find that the supernatural communications adopted by shakespeare were derived from three sources and the contention is that he has retained two of them the goddesses of destiny and the witches and the evidence of this retention is the third proof relied on namely that the stage direction in the first folio act four scene one is enter hecate and the other three witches when three characters supposed to be witches are already upon the scene hollinshead's narrative makes it clear that the idea of the goddesses of destiny was distinctly suggested to shakespeare's mind as well as that of the witches as the means of supernatural influence the question is did he retain both or did he reject one and retain the other it can scarcely be doubted that one such influence running through the play would conduce to harmony and unity of idea and as shakespeare not a servile follower of his source in any case has interwoven in macbeth the totally distinct narrative of the murder of king duff it is hardly to be supposed that he would scruple to blend these two different sets of characters if any advantage were to be gained by so doing as to the stage direction in the first folio it is difficult to see what it would prove even supposing that the folio were the most scrupulous piece of editorial work that had ever been effected it presupposes that the weird sisters are on the stage as well as the witches but it is perfectly clear that the witches continue the dialogue so the other more powerful beings must be supposed to be standing silent in the background a suggestion so monstrous that it is hardly necessary to refer to the slovenliness of the folio stage directions to show how unsatisfactory an argument based upon one of them must be the evidence of foreman and hollinshead has been stated fully in order that the reader may be in possession of all the materials that may be necessary for forming an accurate judgment upon the point in question but it seems to be less relied upon than the supposition that the appearance and powers of the beings in the admittedly genuine part of the third scene of the first act are not those formally attributed to witches and that shakespeare having once decided to represent norns would never have degraded them to three old women who were called by paddock and grimalkin sail in sieves kill swine serve hecate and deal in all the common charms allusions and incantations of vulgar witches the three who look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are aunt they who can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow they who seem corporal but melt into the air like bubbles of the earth the wayward sisters who make themselves air and have in them more than mortal knowledge are not beings of this stamp now there is a great mass of contemporary evidence to show that these supposed characteristics of the norns are in fact 
some of the chief attributes of the witches of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries if this be so if it can be proved that the supposed goddesses of destiny of the play in reality possess no higher powers than could be acquired by ordinary communication with evil spirits then no weight must be attached to the vague stage direction in the folio occurring as it does in a volume notorious for the extreme carelessness with which it was produced and it must be admitted that the goddesses of destiny of holland's head were sacrificed for the sake of the witches if in addition to this it can be shown that there was a very satisfactory reason why the witches should have been chosen as the representatives of the evil influence instead of the norns the argument will be as complete as it is possible to make it but before proceeding to examine the contemporary evidence it is necessary in order to obtain a complete conception of the mythological view of the weird sisters to notice a piece of criticism that is at once an expansion of and a variation upon the theory just stated it is suggested that the sisters of macbeth are but three in number but that shakespeare drew upon scandinavian mythology for a portion of the material he used in constructing these characters and that he derived the rest from the traditions of contemporary witchcraft in fact that the sisters are hybrids between norns and witches the supposed proof of this is that each sister exercises the special function of one of the norns the third is the special prophetess whilst the first takes cognizance of the past and the second of the present in affairs connected with humanity these are the tasks of erder verdandi and Skulta. the first begins by asking when shall we three meet again the second decides the time when the battles lost or won the third the future prophecies that will be ere set of sun the first again asks where the second decides upon the heath the third the future prophecies there to meet with macbeth but their role is most clearly brought out in the famous hails first erder past all hail macbeth hail to thee thane of glamps second verdandi present all hail macbeth hail to thee thane of cador third Skulta. All hail, Macbeth, thou shalt be king hereafter. This sequence is supposed to be retained in other of the sisters' speeches, but a perusal of these will soon show that it is only in the second of the above quotations that it is recognizable with any definiteness, and this, it must be remembered, is an almost verbal transcript from Holland's head, and not an original conception of Shakespeare's who might feel himself quite justified in changing the characters of the speakers while retaining their utterances in addition to this the natural sequence is in many cases utterly and unnecessarily violated as for instance in act one scene three where erder who should be solely occupied with past matters predicts with extreme minuteness the results that are to follow from her projected voyage to aleppo and that without any expression of resentment but rather with promise of assistance from Skulta, whose province she is thus invading but this latter piece of criticism seems open to one grave objection to which the former is not liable mr flay separates the portions of the play which are undoubtedly to be assigned to witches from the parts he gives to his norns and attributes them to different characters the other mixes up the witch and norn elements in one confused mass the earlier critic saw the absurdity of such a supposition when he wrote shakespeare may have raised the wizard and witches of the latter parts of holland's head to the weird sisters of the former parts but the converse process is impossible is it conceivable that shakespeare who as most people admit was a man of some poetic feeling being in possession of the beautiful norn legend the silent fate goddesses sitting at the foot of yggdrasil the mysterious tree of human existence and watering its roots with water from the sacred spring could ruthlessly and without cause 
mar the charm of the legend by the gratuitous introduction of the gross and primarily unpoetical details incident to the practice of witchcraft no man with a glimmer of poetry in his soul will imagine it for a moment the separation of characters is more credible than this but if that theory can be shown to be unfounded there is no improbability in supposing that shakespeare finding that the question of witchcraft was in consequence of events that had taken place not long before the time of the production of macbeth absorbing the attention of all men from king to peasant should set himself to deal with such a popular subject and by the magic of his art so raise it out of its degradation into the region of poetry that men should wonder and say can this be witchcraft indeed end of section seven section eight of elizabethan demonology by thomas alfred spaulding this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by eva davis in comparing the evidence to be deduced from the contemporary records of witchcraft with the sayings and doings of the sisters in macbeth these parts of the play will first be dealt with upon which no doubt as to their genuineness has ever been cast and which are asserted to be solely applicable to norns if it can be shown that these describe witches rather than norns the position that shakespeare intentionally substituted witches for the goddesses of destiny mentioned in his authority is practically unassailable first then it is asserted that the description of the appearance of the sisters given by banquo applies to norns rather than witches they look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are aunt this question of applicability however must not be decided by the consideration of a single sentence but of the whole passage from which it is extracted and whilst considering it it should be carefully borne in mind that it occurs immediately before those lines which are chiefly relied upon as proving the identity of the sisters with erda verdandi and sculta banquo on seeing the sisters says what are these so withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are aunt live you or are you aught that man may question you seem to understand me by each one at once her chappy finger laying upon her skinny lips you should be women and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so it is in the first moment of surprise that the sisters appearing so suddenly seem to banquo unlike the inhabitants of this earth when he recovers from the shock and is capable of deliberate criticism he sees chappy fingers skinny lips in fact nothing to distinguish them from poverty-stricken ugly old women but their beards a more accurate poetical counterpart to the prose descriptions given by contemporary writers of the appearance of the poor creatures who were charged with the crime of witchcraft could hardly have been penned scott for instance says they are women which commonly be old lame blear-eyed pale foul and full of wrinkles they are lean and deformed showing melancholy in their faces and harsnet describes a witch as an old weather-beaten crone having her chin and knees meeting for age walking like a bow leaning on a staff hollow-eyed untoothed furrowed having her lips trembling with palsy going mumbling in the streets one that hath forgotten her paternoster yet hath a shrewd tongue to call a drab a drab it must be remembered that these accounts are by two sceptics who saw nothing in the witches but poor degraded old women in a description which assumes their supernatural power such minute details would not be possible yet there is quite enough in Benquo's description to suggest neglect squalor and misery but if this were not so there is one feature in the description of the sisters that would settle the question once and for ever the beard was in elizabethan times the recognized characteristic of the witch in one old play it is said the women that come to us for disguises must wear beards and that's to say a token of a witch and in another some women have beards marry they are half witches and sir hugh evans gives decisive testimony to the fact when he says of the disguised falstaff 
by yea and no i think the omen is a witch indeed i like not when an omen has a great beard i spy a great beard under her muffler every item of banquo's description indicates that he is speaking of witches nothing in it is incompatible with that supposition will it apply with equal force to norns it can hardly be that these mysterious mythical beings who exercise an incomprehensible yet powerful influence over human destiny could be described with any propriety in terms so revolting a veil of wild weird grandeur might be thrown around them but can it be supposed that shakespeare would degrade them by representing them with chappy fingers skinny lips and beards it is particularly to be noticed too that although in this passage he is making an almost verbal transcript from hollinshead these details are interpolated without the authority of the chronicle let it be supposed for an instant that the text ran thus banquo what are these so withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are aunt live you or are you aught that man may question macbeth speak if you can what are you first witch all hail macbeth hail to thee thane of glams second witch all hail macbeth hail to thee thane of cador third witch all hail macbeth thou shall be king hereafter this is so accurate a dramatization of the parallel passage in holland's head and so entire in itself that there is some temptation to ask whether it was not so written at first and the interpolated lines subsequently inserted by the author whether this be so or not the question must be put why in such a passage did shakespeare insert three lines of most striking description of the appearance of witches can any other reason be suggested than that he had made up his mind to replace the goddesses of destiny by the witches and had determined that there should be no possibility of any doubt arising about it the next objection is that the sisters exercised powers that witches did not possess they can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not in other words they foretell future events which witches could not do but this is not the fact the recorded witch trials teem with charges of having prophesied what things were about to happen no charge is more common the following quoted by charles knight in his biography of shakespeare might almost have suggested the simile in the last mentioned lines Jeanette wishart is indicted for passing to the green growing corn in may twenty-two years since or thereby sitting there upon timus in the morning before the sun rising and being there found and demanded what she was doing thou answered i shall tell thee i have been peeling the blades of the corn i find it will be a dear year the blade of the corn grows withersons and when it grows some goddess about it will be a good cheap year the following is another apt illustration of the power which has been translated from the unwieldy lowland scotch account of the trial of bessie roy in fifteen ninety the ditte charged her thus you are indicted and accused that whereas when you were dwelling with william king and barda about twelve years ago or thereabouts and having gone into the field to pluck lint with other women in their presence made a compass in the earth and a hole in the midst thereof and afterwards by thy conjurations thou caused a great worm to come up first out of the said hole and creep over the compass and next a little worm came forth which crept over also and last thou caused a great worm to come forth which could not pass over the compass but fell down and died which enchantment and witchcraft thou interpretedst in this form that the first great worm that crept over the compass was the goodman william king who should live and the little worm was a child in the goodwife's womb who was unknown to any one to be with child and that the child should live and thirdly the last great worm thou interpretedst to be the goodwife who should die which came to pass after thy speaking surely there could hardly be plainer instances of looking into the seeds of time and saying which grain will grow and which will not than these perhaps this is the most convenient place for pointing out the full meaning of the first scene of macbeth and its necessary connection with the rest of the play it is in fact the fag end of a witch's sabbath 
which if fully represented would bear a strong resemblance to the scene at the commencement of the fourth act but a long scene on such a subject would be tedious and unmeaning at the commencement of the play the audience is therefore left to assume that the witches have met performed their conjurations obtained from the evil spirits the information concerning macbeth's career that they desired to obtain and perhaps have been commanded by the fiends to perform the mission they subsequently carry through all that is needed for the dramatic effect is a slight hint of probable diabolical interference and that macbeth is to be the special object of it and this is done in as artistic a manner as is perhaps imaginable in the first scene they obtain their information in the second they utter their prediction every minute detail of these scenes is based upon the broad recognized facts of witchcraft it is also suggested that the power of vanishing from the sight possessed by the sisters the power to make themselves air was not characteristic of witches but this is another assertion that would not have been made had the authorities upon the subject been investigated with only slight attention no feature of the crime of witchcraft is better attested than this and the modern witch of story-books is still represented as riding on a broomstick a relic of the enchanted rod with which the devil used to provide his worshippers upon which to come to his sabbaths one of the charges in the indictment against the notorious dr fian ran thus fillet for suffering himself to be carried to north berwick kirk as if he had been souchened athwart the eared most effectual ointments were prepared for effecting this method of locomotion which have been recorded and are given below as an illustration of the wild kind of recipes which shakespeare rendered more grim in his caldron scene the efficacy of these ointments is well illustrated by a story narrated by reginald scott which unfortunately on account of certain incidents cannot be given in his own terse words the hero of it happened to be staying temporarily with a friend and on one occasion found her rubbing her limbs with a certain preparation and mumbling the while after a time she vanished out of his sight and he being curious to investigate the affair rubbed himself with the remaining ointment and almost immediately he found himself transported a long distance through the air and deposited right in the very midst of a witch's sabbath naturally alarmed he cried out in the name of god what make i here and upon these words the whole assembly vanished away the only vestige of a difficulty therefore that remains is the use of the term weird sisters in describing the witches it is perfectly clear that Hollins had used these words as a sort of synonym for the goddesses of destiny but with such a mass of evidence has been produced to show that shakespeare elected to introduce witches in the place of the norns it surely would not be unwarrantable to suppose that he might retain this term as a poetical and not unsuitable description of the characters to whom it was applied and this is the less improbable as it can be shown that both words were at times applied to witches as the quotation given subsequently proves the scotch witches were in the habit of speaking of the frequenters of a particular sabbath as the sisters and in haywood's witches of lancashire one of the characters says about a certain act of supposed witchcraft i remember that some three months since i crossed a wayward woman one that i now suspect here then in the very stronghold of the supposed proof of the norn theory it is possible to extract convincing evidence that the sisters are intended to be merely witches it is not surprising that other portions of the play in which the sisters are mentioned should confirm this view banquo upon hearing the fulfilment of the prophecy of the second witch clearly expresses his opinion of the origin of the foreknowledge he has received in the exclamation what can the devil speak true for the devil most emphatically spoke through the witches but how could he in any sense be said to speak through norns again macbeth informs his wife that on his arrival at fores he made inquiry into the amount of reliance that could be placed in the utterances of the witches and learned by the perfectest report that they had more in them than mortal knowledge this would be possible enough 
if witches were the subjects of the investigation for their chief title to authority would rest upon the general opinion current in the neighbourhood in which they dwelt but how could such an inquiry be carried out successfully in the case of norns it is noticeable too that macbeth knows exactly where to find the sisters when he wants them and when he says more shall they speak for now i am bent to know by the worst means the worst he makes another clear allusion to the traffic of the witches with the devil after the events recorded in act four scene one macbeth speaks of the prophecies upon which he relies as the equivocation of the fiend and the prophets as those juggling fiends and with reason for he has seen and heard the very devils themselves the masters of the witches and sources of all their evil power every point in the play that bears upon the subject at all tends to show that shakespeare intentionally replaced the goddesses of destiny by witches and that the supposed norn origin of these characters is the result of a somewhat too great eagerness to unfold a novel and startling theory end of section eight section nine of elizabethan demonology by thomas alfred spaulding this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by eva davis assuming therefore that the witch nature of the sisters is conclusively proved it now becomes necessary to support the assertion previously made that good reason can be shown why shakespeare should have elected to represent witches rather than norns it is impossible to read macbeth without noticing the prominence given to the belief that witches had the power of creating storms and other atmospheric disturbances and that they delighted in so doing the sisters elect to meet in thunder lightning or rain to them fair is foul and foul is fair as they hover through the fog and filthy air the whole of the earlier part of the third scene of the first act is one blast of tempest with its attendant devastation they can loose and bind the winds cause vessels to be tempest-tossed at sea and mutilate wrecked bodies they describe themselves as posters of the sea and land the heath they meet upon is blasted and they vanish as breath into the wind macbeth conjures them to answer his questions thus though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches though the yesty waves confound and swallow navigation up though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down though castles topple on their warders heads though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations though the treasure of nature's germans tumble altogether even till destruction sicken now this command over the elements does not form at all a prominent feature in the english records of witchcraft a few isolated charges of the kind may be found in fifteen sixty five for instance a witch was burnt who confessed that she had caused all the tempests that had taken place in that year scott too has a few short sentences upon this subject but does not give it the slightest prominence nor in the earlier scotch trials recorded by pitcairn does this charge appear amongst the accusations against the witches it is exceedingly curious to notice the utter harmless nature of the charges brought against the earlier culprits and how as time went on and the panic increased they gradually deepened in colour until no act was too gross too repulsive or too ridiculously impossible to be excluded from the indictment the following quotations from one of the earliest reported trials are given because they illustrate most forcibly the condition of the poor women who were supposed to be witches and the real basis of fact upon which the belief in the crime subsequently built itself bessie dunlop was tried for witchcraft in fifteen seventy six one of the principal accusations against her was that she held intercourse with a devil who appeared to her in the shape of a neighbor of hers one tom reed who had recently died being asked how and where she met tom reed she said as she was gangin betwixt her own house and the yard of moncastle drivin ter kai to the pasture and makin heavy sair do with herself great and very fast for her cow that was dead her husband and child that were lyin sick in the land eel 
and she new risen out of kissain the aforesaid tom met her by the way he'll sit her and said good day bessie and she said god speed you goodman sancta marie said he bessie why makes thou sa great dull and sair greeting for ony wordly thing she answered alas have i not great cause to make great dole for our gear is tracket and my husband is on the point of dead and one baby of my own will not live and myself at any weak point have i not good cause then to have an sair heart but tom said bessie thou hast crab it god and ask it something you sold not have done and therefore i counsel thee to mend to him for i tell thee thy barn shall die and the sick cow or you come home and thy twa sheep shall die too but thy husband shall mend and shall be as hale and fair as ever he was and then i was something blither for he told me that my good men would mend then tom reed went away from me in through the yard of moncastle and i thought that he gate in at a narrower hole of the dyke nor any early man could have gone through and swore it was something flight this was the first time that tom appeared to her on the third occasion he asked her if she would not throw in him she said she would throw in all new body did her good then tom promised her much wealth if she would deny her christendom she answered that if she should be riven at horses tireless she shall never do that but promised to be leal and true to him in only thing she could do whereat he was angry on the fourth occasion the poor woman fell further into sin and accompanied tom to a fairy meeting tom asked her to join the party but she said she saw no profit to gang that kind of gratis unless she came to wherefore tom offered the old inducement wealth but she replied that she dwelt with her awin husband and bareness and could not leave them and so tom began to be very crabbit with her and said if so she thought she would get little good of him she was then demanded if she had ever asked any favour of tom for herself or any other person she answered that when sundry persons came to her to seek help for their beast the cow or ewe or for any barn that was taken away with an evil blast of wind or elf grip it she gait and speared at tom what might help them and tom would pull an herb and give her out of his own hand and bear a shear the same with any other kinds of herbs and open the beastie's mouth and put them in and the beast would mend it seems hardly possible to believe that a story like this which is half marred by the attempt to partially modernize its simple pathetic language and which would probably bring a tear to the eye if not a shilling from the pocket of the most unsympathetic being of the present day should be considered sufficient three hundred years ago to convict the narrator of a crime worthy of death yet so it was this sad picture of the breakdown of a poor woman's intellect in the unequal struggle against poverty and sickness is only made visible to us by the light of the flames that mercifully to her perhaps took poor bessie dunlop away for ever from the sick husband and weakly children and the kai and the humble hovel where they all dwelt together and from the daily heart-rending almost hopeless struggle to obtain enough food to keep life in the bodies of this miserable family the historian who makes it his chief anxiety to record to the minutest and most irrelevant details the deeds noble or ignoble of those who have managed to stamp their names upon the muster-roll of fame turns carelessly or scornfully the page which contains such insignificant matter as this but those who believe that not a worm is cloven in vain that not a moth with vain desire is shrivelled in a fruitless fire or but subserves another's gain will hardly feel that poor bessie's life and death were entirely without their meaning as the trials for witchcraft increase however the details grow more and more revolting and in the year fifteen ninety we find a most extraordinary batch of cases extraordinary for the monstrosity of the charges contained in them and also for the fact that this feature so insisted upon in macbeth the raising of winds and storms stands out in extremely bold relief the explanation of this is as follows in the year fifteen eighty nine king james the sixth brought his bride anne of denmark home to scotland 
during the voyage an unusually violent storm raged which scattered the vessels composing the royal escort and it would appear caused the destruction of one of them by a marvellous chance the king's ship was driven by a wind which blew directly contrary to that which filled the sails of the other vessels and the king and queen were both placed in extreme jeopardy james who seems to have been as perfectly convinced of the reality of witchcraft as he was of his own infallibility at once came to the conclusion that the storm had been raised by the aid of evil spirits for the express purpose of getting rid of so powerful an enemy of the prince of darkness as the righteous king the result was that a rigorous investigation was made into the whole affair a great number of persons were tried for attempting the king's life by witchcraft and that prince undeterred by the apparent impropriety of being judge in what was in reality his own cause presided at many of the trials condescended to superintend the tortures applied to the accused in order to extort a confession and even went so far in one case as to write a letter to the judges commanding a condemnation under these circumstances considering who the prosecutor was and who the judge and the effectual methods at the service of the court for extorting confessions it is not surprising that the king's surmises were fully justified by the statements of the accused it is impossible to read these without having parts of the witch scenes in macbeth ringing in the ears like an echo john fian a young schoolmaster and leader of the gang or coven as it was called was charged with having caused the leak in the king's ship and with having raised the wind and created a mist for the purpose of hindering his voyage on another occasion he and several other witches entered into a ship and caused it to perish he was also able by witchcraft to open locks he visited churchyards at night and dismembered bodies for his charms the bodies of unbaptized infants being preferred agnes sampson confessed to the king that to compass his death she took a black toad and hung it by the hind legs for three days and collected the venom that fell from it she said that if she could have obtained a piece of linen that the king had worn she could have destroyed his life with this venom causing him such extraordinary pains as if he had been lying upon sharp thorns or endis of needles she went out to sea to a vessel called the grace of god and when she came away the devil raised a wind and the vessel was wrecked she delivered a letter from fian to another witch which was to this effect ye sa warn the rest of the sisters to raise the wind this day at elwyn oris to stay the queenis coming in scotland this is her confession as to the methods adopted for raising the storm at the time when his majesty was in denmark she being accompanied by the parties before specially named took a cat and christened it and afterwards bound to each part of that cat the chiefest parts of a dead man and the several joints of his body and that in the night following the said cat was conveyed into the midst of the sea by all these witches sailing in their riddles or sieves as is aforesaid and so left the said cat right before the town of leith in scotland this done there did arise such a tempest in the sea as a greater hath not been seen which tempest was the cause of the perishing of a vessel coming over from the town of brunt island to the town of leith again it is confessed that the said christened cat was the cause that the king's majesty's ship at his coming forth of denmark had a contrary wind to the rest of his ships it is worth a note that this art of going to sea in sieves which shakespeare has referred to in his drama seems to have been peculiar to this set of witches english witches had the reputation of being able to go upon the water in egg-shells and cockle-shells but seem never to have detected any peculiar advantages in the sieve not so these scotch witches agnes told the king that she with a great many other witches to the number of two hundredth all together went to sea each one in a riddle or sieve and went into the same very substantially with flagons of wine making merry and drinking by the way in the same riddles or sieves to the kirk of north barrack in lothian and that after they landed they took hands on the land and danced a reel or short dance 
they then opened the graves and took the fingers toes and knees of the bodies to make charms it can be easily understood that these trials created an intense excitement in scotland the result was that a tract was printed containing a full account of all the principal incidents and the fact that this pamphlet was reprinted once if not twice in london shows that interest in the affair spread south of the border and this is confirmed by the publisher's prefatorial apology in which he states that the pamphlet was printed to prevent the public from being imposed upon by unauthorized and extravagant statements of what had taken place under ordinary circumstances events of this nature would form a nine days wonder and then die a natural death but in this particular case the public interest continued for an abnormal time for eight years subsequent to the date of the trials james published his demonology a work founded to a great extent upon his experiences at the trials of fifteen ninety this was a sign to both england and scotland that the subject of witchcraft was still of engrossing interest to him and as he was then the fully recognized heir apparent to the english crown the publication of such a work would not fail to induce a great amount of attention to the subject dealt with in sixteen o three he ascended the english throne his first parliament met on the nineteenth of march sixteen o four and on the twenty seventh of the same month a bill was brought into the house of lords dealing with the question of witchcraft it was referred to a committee of which twelve bishops were members and this committee after much debating came to the conclusion that the bill was imperfect in consequence of this a fresh one was drawn and by the ninth of june a statute had passed both houses of parliament which enacted among other things that if any person shall practise or exercise any invocation or conjuration of any evil or wicked spirit or shall consult with entertain feed or reward any evil and wicked spirit or take up any dead man woman or child out of his her or their grave or the skin bone or any other part of any dead person to be employed or used in any manner of witchcraft or shall practise any witchcraft whereby any person shall be killed wasted pined or lamed in his or her body or any part thereof such offenders shall suffer the pains of death as felons without benefit of clergy or sanctuary hutchinson in his essay on witchcraft published in seventeen twenty declares that this statute was framed expressly to meet the offences exposed by the trials of fifteen ninety ninety one but although this cannot be conclusively proved yet it is not at all improbable that the hurry with which the statute was passed into law immediately upon the accession of james would recall to the public mind the interest he had taken in those trials in particular and the subject in general and that shakespeare producing as nearly all the critics agree his tragedy at about this date should draw upon his memory for the half-forgotten details of those trials and thus embody in macbeth the allusions to them that have been pointed out much less accurately than he did in the case of the babington affair because the facts had been far less carefully recorded and the time at which his attention had been called to them far more remote there is one other mode of temptation which was adopted by the evil spirits implicated to a great extent with the traditions of witchcraft but nevertheless more suitably handled as a separate subject which is of so gross and revolting a nature that it should willingly be passed over in silence were it not for the fact that the belief in it was as scott says so strongly and universally received in the times of elizabeth and james from the very earliest period of the christian era the affection of one sex for the other was considered to be under the special control of the devil marriage was to be tolerated but celibacy was the state most conducive to the near intercourse with heaven that was so dearly sought after this opinion was doubtless generated by the tendency of the early christian leaders to hold up the events of the life rather than the teachings of the sacred founder of the sect as the one rule of conduct to be received by his followers to have been the recipients of the stigmata was a far greater evidence of holiness and favor with heaven than the quiet and unnoted daily practice of those virtues upon which christ pronounced his blessing 
and in less improbable matters they did not scruple in their enthusiasm to attempt to establish a rule of life in direct contradiction to the laws of that universe of which they professed to believe him to be the creator the futile attempt to imitate his immaculate purity blinded their eyes to the fact that he never taught or encouraged celibacy among his followers and this gradually led them to the strange conclusion that the passion which sublimed and brought under control is the source of man's noblest and holiest feelings was a prompting proceeding from the author of all evil imbued with this idea religious enthusiasts of both sexes immured themselves in convents took oaths of perpetual celibacy and even in certain isolated cases sought to compromise with heaven and baffle the tempter by rendering a fall impossible forgetting that the victory over sin does not consist in immunity from temptation but being tempted not to fall but no convent walls are so strong as to shut great nature out and even within these sacred precincts the ascetics found that they were not free from the temptations of their arch enemy in consequence of this a belief sprang up and spread from its original source into the outer world in a class of devils called incubi and succubi who roamed the earth with no other object than to tempt people to abandon their purity of life the cases of assault by incubi were much more frequent than those by succubi just as women were much more affected by the dancing manias in the fifteenth century than men the reason perhaps being that they are much less capable of resisting physical privation but according to the belief of the middle ages there was no generic difference between the incubus and succubus here was a belief that when the witch fury sprang up attached itself as a matter of course as the phase of the crime and it was an almost universal charge against the accused that they offended in this manner with their familiars and hundreds of poor creatures suffered death upon such an indictment more details will be found in the authorities upon this unpleasant subject this intercourse did not as a rule result in offspring but this was not universally the case all badly deformed or monstrous children were suspected of having had such an undesirable parentage and there was a great tendency to believe that they ought to be destroyed luther was a decided advocate of this course deeming the destruction of a life far preferable to the chance of having a devil in the family in drayton's poem the moon calf one of the gossips present at the birth of the calf suggests that it ought to be buried alive as a monster caliban is a moon calf and his origin is distinctly traced to a source of this description it is perfectly clear what was the one thing that the foul witch sycorax did which prevented her life from being taken and it would appear from this that the inhabitants of argier were far more merciful in this respect than their european neighbours such a charge would have sent any woman to the stake in scotland without the slightest hope of mercy and the usual plea for respite would only have been an additional reason for hastening the execution of the sentence in the preceding pages an endeavour has been made to delineate the most prominent features of a belief which the great reformation was destined first to foster into unnatural proportions and vitality and in the end to destroy up to the period of the reformation the creed of the nation had been practically uniform and one set of dogmas was unhesitatingly accepted by the people as infallible and therefore hardly demanding critical consideration the great upheaval of the sixteenth century rent this quiescent uniformity into shreds doctrines until then considered as indisputable were brought within the pale of discussion and hence there was a great diversity of opinion not only between the supporters of the old and of the new faith but between the reformers themselves this was conspicuously the case with regard to the belief in the devils and their works the more timid of the reformers clung in a great measure to the catholic opinions a small band under the influence possibly of that knight errant of freedom of thought giordano bruno who exercised some considerable influence during his visit to england by means of his oxford lectures and disputations entirely denied the existence of evil spirits 
but the great majority gave in their adherence to a creed that was the mean between the doctrines of the old faith and the new scepticism their strong common sense compelled them to reject the puerilities advanced as serious evidence by the catholic church but they cast aside with equal vehemence and more horror the doctrines of the bruno school that there are devils says bullinger reduced apparently from argument to invective the sadducees in times past denied and at this day also some scarce religious nay rather epicures deny the same who unless they repent shall one day feel to their exceeding great pain and smart both that there are devils and that they are the tormentors and executioners of all wicked men and epicures it must be remembered too that the emancipation from medievalism was a very gradual process not as we are too prone to think it a revolution suddenly and completely effected it was an evolution not an explosion there is found in consequence a great divergence of opinion not only between the earliest and the later reformers but between the statements of the same man at different periods of his career tyndall for instance seems to have believed in the actual possession of the human body by devils and this appears to have been the opinion of the majority at the beginning of the reformation for the first prayer book of edward the sixth contained the catholic form of exorcism for driving devils out of children which was expunged upon revision the doctrine of obsession having in the meantime triumphed over the older belief it is necessary to bear these facts in mind whilst considering any attempt to depict the general bearings of a belief such as that in evil spirits for many irreconcilable statements are to be found among the authorities and it is the duty of the writer to sift out and describe those views which predominated and these must not be supposed to be proved inaccurate because a chance quotation can be produced in contradiction end of section nine Section 10 of Elizabethan Demonology by Thomas Alfred Spaulding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eva Davis. There is great danger in the attempt to bring under analysis any phase of religious belief that the method of treatment may appear unsympathetic if not irreverent. The greatest effort has been made in these pages to avoid this fault as far as possible. For without doubt, any form of religious dogma however barbarous however seemingly ridiculous if it has once been sincerely believed and trusted by any portion of mankind is entitled to reverent treatment no body of great and good men can at any time credit and take comfort from a lie pure and simple and if an extinct creed appears to lack that foundation of truth which makes creeds tolerable it is safer to assume that it had a meaning and a truthfulness to those who held it that lapse of time has tended to destroy together with the creed itself than to condemn men wholesale as knaves and hypocrites but the particular subject which has here been dealt with will surely be considered to be specially entitled to respect when it is remembered that it was once an integral portion of the belief of most of our best and bravest ancestors of men and women who dared to witness to their own sincerity amidst the fires of persecution and in the solitude of exile it has nearly all disappeared now the terrific hierarchy of fiends which was so real so full of horror three hundred years ago has gradually vanished away before the advent of fuller knowledge and purer faith and is now hardly thought of unless as a dead medieval myth but let us deal tenderly with it remembering that the day may come when the beliefs that are nearest to our hearts may be treated as open to contempt or ridicule and the dogmas to which we most passionately cling will like an insubstantial pageant faded leave not a rack behind footnote perhaps the following prayer contained in thomas beckon's palmander shows more clearly than the comments of any critic the reality of the terror an infinite number of wicked angels there are o lord christ which without ceasing seek my destruction against this exceeding great multitude of evil spirits send thou me thy blessed and heavenly angels 
which may deliver me from then tyranny thou o lord hast devoured hell and overcome the prince of darkness and all his ministers yea and that not for thyself but for those that believe in thee suffer me not therefore to be overcome of satan and his servants but rather let me triumph over them that i through strong faith and help of the blessed angels having the victory of the hellish army may with a joyful heart say death where is thy sting hell where is thy victory and so for ever and ever magnify thy holy name amen parker society page eighty four end of footnote little attempt has hitherto been made in the way of direct proof to show that fairies are really only a class of devils who exercise their powers in a manner less terrible and revolting than that depicted by theologians and for this reason chiefly that the proposition is already more than half established when it has been shown that the attributes and functions possessed by both fairy and devil are similar in kind although differing in degree this has already been done to a great extent in the preceding pages where the various actions of puck and ariel have been shown to differ in no essential respect from those of the devils of the time but before commencing to study this phase of supernaturalism in shakespeare's works as a whole and as indicative to a certain extent of the development of his thought upon the relation of man to the invisible world about and above him it is necessary that this identity should be admitted without a shadow of a doubt it has been shown that fairies were probably the descendants of the lesser local deities as devils were of the more important of the heathen gods that were overturned by the advancing wave of christianity although in the course of time this distinction was entirely obliterated and forgotten it has also been shown as before mentioned that many of the powers exercised by fairies were in their essence similar to those exercised by devils especially that of appearing in diverse shapes these parallels could be carried out to an almost unlimited extent but a few proofs only need to be cited to show this identity in the medieval romance of king orfeo fairyland has been substituted for the classical hades king james in his demonology adopts a fourfold classification of devils one of which he names fairy and coordinates with the incubus the name of the devil supposed to preside at the witch's sabbaths is sometimes given as hecate diana sibylla sometimes queen of elfheim or fairy indeed shakespeare's line in the comedy of errors had it not been unnecessarily tampered with by the critics a fiend a fairy pitiless and rough would have conclusively proved this identity of character the real distinction between these two classes of spirits depends on the condition of national thought upon the subject of supernaturalism in its largest sense a belief which has little or no foundation upon indisputable phenomena must be continually passing through varying phases and these phases will be regulated by the nature of the subjects upon which the attention of the mass of the people is most firmly concentrated hence when a nation has but one religious creed and one that has for centuries been accepted by them almost without question or doubt faith becomes stereotyped and the mind assumes an attitude of passive receptivity undisturbed by doubts or questionings under such conditions a belief in evil spirits ever ready and watching to tempt a man into heresy of belief or sinful act and thus to destroy both body and soul although it may exist as a theoretic portion of the accepted creed cannot possibly become a vital doctrine to be believed by the general public it may exist as a subject for learned dispute to while away the leisure hours of divines but cannot by any possibility obtain an influence over the thoughts and lives of their charges mental disturbance on questions of doctrinal importance being for those reasons out of the question the attention of the people is almost entirely riveted upon questions of material ease and advantage the little lets and hindrances of everyday life in agricultural and domestic matters are the tribulations that appeal most incessantly to the ineradicable sense of an invisible power adverse to the interests of mankind and consequently 
the class of evil spirits believed in at such a time will be fairies rather than devils malicious little spirits who blight the growing corn stop the butter from forming in the churn pinch the sluttish housemaid black and blue and whose worst act is the exchange of the baby from its cot for a fairy changeling beings of a nature most exasperating to thrifty housewife and hard-handed farmer but nevertheless not irrevocably prejudiced against humanity and easily to be pacified and reduced into a state of fawning friendship by such little attentions as could be rendered without difficulty by the poorest cotter the whole fairy mythology is perfumed with an honest healthy careless joy in life and a freedom from mental doubt i love true lovers honest men good fellows good housewives good meat good drink and all things that good is but nothing that is ill declares robin goodfellow and this jovial materialism only reflects the state of mind of the folk who were not unwilling to believe that this lively little spirit might be seen of nights busying himself in their houses by the dying embers of the deserted fire such seems to have been the condition of england immediately before the period of the great reformation but with the progress of that revolution of thought the condition changes the one true and eternal creed as it had been deemed is shattered for ever men who have hitherto accepted their religious convictions in much the same way as they had succeeded to their patrimonies are compelled by this tide of opposition to think and study for themselves each man finds himself left face to face with the great hereafter and his relation to it terrible doctrines are formulated and press themselves with remorseless vigour upon his understanding original sin justification by faith eternal damnation for even honest error of belief doctrines that throw an atmosphere of solemnity if not gloom about national thought in which no fairy mythology can flourish it is no longer questions of material ease and gain that are of the chief concern and consequently the fairies and their doings from their own triviality fall far into the background and their place is occupied by a countless horde of remorseless schemers who are never ceasing in their efforts to drag both body and soul to perdition but it is in the towns the centres of interchange of thought of learning and of controversy that this revolution first gathers power the sparsely populated countrysides are far more impervious to the new ideas and the country people cling far longer and more tenaciously to the dying religion and its attendant beliefs the rural districts were but little affected by the reformation for years after it had triumphed in the towns and consequently the beliefs of the inhabitants were hardly touched by the struggle that was going on within so short a distance we find a reginald scott indeed complaining half in joke half in sarcasm that robin goodfellow has long disappeared from the land but it is only from the towns that he has fled towns in which the spirit of the cartwrights and the latimers the barnums and the delibers is abroad in the same cambridge where scott had been educated a young student had hanged himself because the shadow of the doctrine of predestination was too terrible for him to live under and such a place was surely no home for puck and his merry band but in the country places remote from the growl and trembling of this mental earthquake he still loved to lurk and even at the very moment when scott was penning the denial of his existence he was nestling among the woods and flowers of avonside an invisible whispering in the ear of a certain fair-haired youth there thoughts of no inconsiderable moment and long time after that after the youth had become a man and had coined those thoughts into words that glitter still after his monument had been erected in the quiet stratford churchyard puck revelled harmless and undisturbed among many a countryside nay even to the present day in some old world nooks a faint whispering rumour of him may still be heard now perhaps one of the most distinctive marks of literary genius is a certain receptivity of mind 
a capability of receiving impressions from all surrounding circumstance of extracting from all sources whether from nature or man consciously or unconsciously the material upon which it shall work for this process to be perfectly accomplished an entire and enthusiastic sympathy with man and the current ideas of the time is absolutely essential and in proportion as this sympathy is contracted and partial so will the work produced be stunted and untrue and on the other hand the more universal and entire it is the more perfect and vital will be the art bearing this in mind and also the facts that shakespeare's early training was effected in a little country village that upon the verge of manhood he came to london where he spent his prime in contact with the bustle and friction of busy town life and that the later years of his life were passed in the quiet retirement of the home of his boyhood there would be good ground for an argument a priori even were there none of a more conclusive nature that his earlier works would be found impregnated with the country fairy myths with which his youth would come in contact that the result of the labors of his middle life would show that these earlier reminiscences had been gradually obliterated by the gloomier influence of ideas that were the result of the struggle of opposed theories that had not then ceased to rage in the towns and that the diabolic element and the questions relating thereto would predominate and that finally his later works written under the calmer influence of stratford life would show a certain return to the fairy lore of his earlier years but fortunately we are not left to rely upon any such hypothetical evidence in this matter however probable it may appear although the general reading public cannot be asked to accept as infallible any chronological order of shakespeare's plays that dogmatically asserts a particular sequence or to investigate the somewhat dry and specialist arguments upon which the conclusions are founded yet there are certain groupings into periods which are agreed upon as accurate by nearly all critics and which without the slightest danger of error may be asserted to be correct for instance it is indisputable that love's labours lost the comedy of errors romeo and juliet and a midsummer night's dream are amongst shakespeare's earliest works that the tragedies of julius caesar hamlet othello macbeth and lear are the productions of his middle life between sixteen hundred and sixteen o six and that a winter's tale and the tempest are amongst the latest plays which he wrote here we have everything that is required to prove the question in hand at the commencement and at the end of his writings when a youth fresh from the influence of his country nurture and education and when a mature man settling down into the old life again after a long and victorious struggle with the world with his accumulated store of experience we find plays which are perfectly saturated with fairy lore the dream and the tempest these are the poles of shakespeare's thought in this respect and in the centre embedded as it were between two layers of material that do not bear any distinctive stamp of their own but appear rather as a medium for uniting the diverse strata lie the great tragedies produced while he was in the very rush and swirl of town life and reflecting accurately as we have seen many of the doubts and speculations that were agitating in the minds of men who were ardently searching out truth it is worth noting too in passing that directly shakespeare steps out of his beaten path to depict in the merry wives of windsor the happy country life and manners of his day he at the same time returns to fairyland again and brings out the windsor children trooping to pinch and plague the town-bred tainted falstaff but this is not by any means all that this subject reveals to us about shakespeare if it were the less said about it the better to look upon the tempest as in its essence merely a return to the dream the end is the beginning to believe that his thoughts worked in a weary unending circle that the valley of the shadow of death only leads back to the foot of the hill difficulty is intolerable and not more intolerable than false although based upon similar material 
the ideas and tendencies of the tempest upon supernaturalism are no more identical with those of a midsummer night's dream than the thoughts of baroon upon things in general are those of hamlet or hamlet's those of prospero but before it is possible to point out the nature of this difference and to show that a change is a natural growth of thought not a mere retrogression a few explanatory remarks are necessary there is no more insufficient and misleading view of shakespeare and his work than that which until recently obtained almost universal credence and is even at the present time somewhat loudly asserted in some quarters namely that he was a man of considerable genius who wrote and got acted some thirty plays more or less simply for commercial purposes and nothing more made money thereby and died leaving a will and that beyond this he and his works are and must remain an inexplicable mystery the critic who holds this view and finds it equally advantageous to commence the study of shakespeare's work by taking the tempest or love's labours lost as his text is about as judicious as the botanist who would enlarge upon the structure of the seed pod without first explaining the preliminary stages of plant growth or the architect who would dilate upon the most convenient arrangement of chimney pots before he had discussed the laws of foundation the plays may be studied separately and studied so are found beautiful but taken in an approximate chronological order like a string of brilliant jewels each one gains lustre from those that precede and follow it for no man ever wrote sincerely and earnestly or indeed ever did any one thing in such a spirit without leaving some impress upon his work of his mental condition whilst he was doing it and no such man ever continued his literary labours from the period of youth right through his manhood without leaving behind him in more or less legible character a record of the ripening of his thought upon matters of eternal importance although they may not be of necessity directly connected with the ostensible subject in hand insincere men may ape sentiments they do not really believe in but in the end they will either be exposed and held up to ridicule or their work will sink into obscurity sincerity in the expression of genuine thought and feeling alone can stand the test of time and this is in reality no contradiction to what has just been said as to the necessity of a receptive condition of mind in the production of works of true genius this capacity of receiving the most delicate objective impressions is indeed one essential but without the cognate power to assimilate this food and evolve the result that these influences have produced subjectively it is worse than useless the two must coexist and act and react upon one another nor must we be induced to surrender these principles in the present particular case on account of the usual fine but vague talk about shakespeare's absolute self-annihilation in favour of the characters that he depicts it is said that shakespeare so identifies himself with each person in his dramas that it is impossible to detect the great master and his thoughts behind this cunningly devised screen if this means that shakespeare has always a perfect comprehension of his characters is competent to measure out to each absolute and unerring justice and is capable of sympathy with even the most repulsive it will not be disputed for an instant it is so true that it is dangerous to take a sentence out of the mouth of any one of his characters and say for certain this shakespeare thought although there are many characters with whom every one must feel that shakespeare identified himself for the time being rather than others but if it is intended to assert that shakespeare has so eliminated himself from his writings as to make it impossible to trace anywhere the tendencies of his own thought at the time when he was writing it must be most emphatically denied for the reasons just stated freedom from prejudice must be carefully dissociated from lack of interest in the motive that underlies the construction of each play there is a tone or keynote in each drama that indicates the author's mental condition at the time when it was produced and if several plays following each other in brisk succession 
all have the same predominant tone it seems to be past question that shakespeare is incidentally and indirectly uttering his own personal thought and experience end of section ten